Hi folks, straight to the point. In a time where Vladimir Putin is trying to deny the existence and legitimacy of Ukraine and its own unique language, culture and history, now is indeed the time to explore Ukrainian history. Georgie over at Kings and Generals channel reached out to me and many, many other history YouTubers and proposed Project Ukraine. This is a playlist dedicated to telling the past of the Ukrainian people to aid them in the present. Your likes, shares and indeed your donations to the charity we are collaborating with will have a direct impact in aiding the most vulnerable citizens of Ukraine. We have partnered with the Babanyar Holocaust Memorial Center in Kyiv, which was bombed by the Russian troops at the start of the invasion. Today, the foundation has transformed its projects, uh, refocusing its resources and efforts on purchasing and delivering humanitarian aid to civilians and evacuating people from combat zones. In the first week of April, the center provided over 7,000 food baskets to patients and doctors at Kyiv hospitals, to bomb shelters in Kyiv underground, as well as to people with disabilities and elderly people who cannot leave their own homes. They also provided targeted assistance to over 3,000 people, delivering specific medications, food and hygiene products on individual requests. We hope that viewers would consider donating to this noble cause and help with the humanitarian situation in Ukraine. Manny Man Does History It is April 2022 and the world has been watching the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Ukraine declared independence in 1991 with the fall of the Soviet Union. But even before that, the peoples of these borderlands have expressed their independence in different ways throughout history. Being part of the Eurasian steppe, large flat grasslands, the territory around what we now know as Ukraine saw many peoples and cultures pass through over thousands of years, and indeed many people settled here too. In the early Bronze Age, you had the Yamna culture, who built massive tombs for their dead. Other cultures came through the Iron Age, including the Scythian Kingdom, and as ancient Greece came to prominence, they colonized areas along the Black Sea. Persian Emperor Darius subjugated much of these areas, but they would later continue as Roman and Byzantine cities. Further north of the Black Sea emerged a culture centered around where would become Kyiv, which was one of the earliest Slavic cultures in Europe. To the south, Germanic tribes of Goths and Ostrogoths came and conquered. And then the Huns came and conquered, but were ultimately defeated by the Ostrogoths. As a reward, the Romans granted the Ostrogoths land in Pannonia, creating a power vacuum further east, filled by the now spreading Slavic peoples. Some of these folks, known as the Antes, helped defend the Eastern Roman Empire. After an attack from the nomadic Pannonian Avars, the various Slavic groups became scattered and isolated. Along the northeast coast of the Black Sea, the Bulgars formed Old Great Bulgaria, only for it to later come under the control of the Khazar Khaganate. Records from this time can be scant and sometimes conflicting, depending on when and where they were written, so elements of these details are worth taking with a pinch of salt. The city of Kiev was conquered by Oleg of Novgorod, a prince of Viking descent. He established Kievan Rus, a massive kingdom spanning much further north. Kiev, being central to many trade routes, flourished and became a multi-ethnic city and a centre of Slavic unity and power. Sixty years later, they went to war with the Byzantines, but they lost. In 988, the government in Kievan Rus accepted Christianity as their religion, being greatly promoted by Grand Duke Vladimir the Great, who helped bring about the Golden Age of Kiev. By the 12th century, Kievan Rus was the largest state in Europe. The name Ukraine began to emerge on old documents and maps, referring to the South as a borderland. Around this time, Moscow emerged on maps too. The various principalities of Kievan Rus began to tussle for power, during which Kiev was sacked. 
Decades later, the Mongols invaded, driving the Kuman people of Crimea up into the mountains and laying waste to Kiev, forcing most local people to flee. During this time, the Ukrainian part of Kievan Rus would evolve into the Kingdom of Galicia Volhynia, later known as the Ruthenian Kingdom. The Cumans would eventually emerge from the mountains again and begin to mix with other people living in Crimea, ultimately becoming the Crimean Tatars. The Turkic people of the northwestern Mongol Empire, known as the Golden Horde, would separate, becoming their own Khanate. The northwestern powers of Poland and Lithuania fought off the Golden Horde and took control of Ukraine. Ukrainians at that time were known as Ruthenians, and they had much influence and success in their own region under Lithuania. Poland would gain more control over Ukraine, bringing in an influx of Polish people and other groups ousting Ukrainians from power and influence and forcing them into central Ukraine. As the Golden Horde's power waned, the area around Crimea formed its own Khanate. This ultimately came under the control of the Ottoman Empire, who would begin funneling enslaved Ukrainians and other Slavic people captured by the Tatars to the Middle East. As Polish oppression intensified on Ukrainians, they rose up in rebellion in 1490, led by Petro Mucha. In 1569, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was formed, with Ukraine coming under the Polish crown. During this time, the new ideas of the Renaissance spread through Poland, and with it came Polish promotion of Catholicism. Many Ukrainians would remain Orthodox. Some groups living out along the wild fields were known as Cossacks, and they avoided Polish serfdom, serfdom being forced into farming for Poland. Cossacks would gain a reputation for their fierce fighting skills, and would later become part of the Commonwealth armies, holding off the Tatars from Crimea and the Tsardom of Russia. Cossacks rebelled against the Polish in 1648, leading to the Cossack Hetmanate, but also a time of chaos and war, known as the Deluge, as Ukraine found itself surrounded by enemies. After decades of strife, Ukraine was divided up between Poland and Russia. The control of the Orthodox Church in Kiev would later be taken over by Moscow. What first started out as the Russians protecting the Cossacks became control, and the Tsarists tightened their grip on Ukraine. There was a violent peasant revolt in the late 1760s in which Cossacks murdered many people in Uman. The uprising was quelled, but the idea of a Ukrainian state amongst Ukrainians emerged. In its ongoing wars with the Ottoman Empire, Russia took control of Crimea and ultimately dissolved the Crimean Khanate. At this point, I would just like to draw attention to an Irishman named Dennis McClare, who had travelled to where is now Ukraine and became a very successful landscape gardener. I mention him here as I had been working on a project with Martin Reuter of Multicultural Ukraine Exchange Network to make this interesting connection between Ireland and Ukraine. Sadly, Martin passed away in late 2021, so I include this here as a tribute to both Martin Reuter and Dennis McClare. At the same time as the French Revolution in the West, Poland found itself slowly but surely being conquered by its neighbours, eventually being divided up by Prussia, Russia and Austria. Ukraine would now lie divided between the Russian and Austrian empires. Russia began banning the Ukrainian language and culture in order to Russify them, but Ukrainian nationalism rose amidst the oppression. Many Ukrainian intellectuals fled to the western, now Austrian, side of Ukraine, where they would be used as political pawns by the Austrians. Throughout the 19th century, Russia was an ever-growing power in Europe, so much so that the British, French and Ottoman empires combined their strength to fight and defeat Russia in the Crimean War. The Russian defeat banned Russia from building a navy along the Black Sea and led to a move to modernise Russia, including the abolition of serfdom, affecting the workers in Ukraine. In the late 19th century, many Ukrainians travelled to the New World, to Canada, in the similar prairies of Manitoba, Saskatchewan and Alberta. 
Many would follow throughout the 20th century. With the outbreak of World War I, any Ukrainians and other Eastern Slavic people living on the Austro-Hungarian side of the border were put in concentration camps seen as Russian sympathisers. As the Russian Empire crumbled to the socialist revolutions of 1917 and the ensuing brutal civil war, Ukraine fought for its independence, but the region devolved into utter chaos as many factions claimed control. From the anarchy ultimately emerged the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, which became engulfed by the growing power of the Soviet Union. As Joseph Stalin took control of the Soviet Union, he had all the food produced in Ukraine and other steppe regions distributed elsewhere to more industrialised areas across the Union, causing between 6 and 8 million people to die of starvation, helping to depopulate Ukraine. This atrocity is known as the Holodomor in Ukraine. As Nazi Germany invaded the Soviet Union in 1941, some Ukrainians saw them as liberators. The controversial figure Stepan Bandera proclaimed Ukraine as an independent state, pledging to work with the Nazis. But the Nazis arrested him and established their own Ukrainian state. Some Ukrainians would collaborate with the Wehrmacht to fight their Russian oppressors. Others fought for the Soviets. Bandera's followers fought both sides, still vying for total Ukrainian independence. Many atrocities were committed in Ukraine, some by Nazis, some by collaborators and ethno-nationalists. Let me be clear about this. The politics were messy, and many across Europe collaborated with the Nazis in various ways. Just because there were some Nazi collaborators does not mean everyone was Nazi collaborators. As the Soviet Union pushed back against the Nazis, Stalin had the Tatars of Crimea deported to Uzbekistan, Stalin looking to further Russify Crimea. Just in time for one of the final conferences amongst the Allied leaders of World War II to be held there. After the Germans surrendered, the Crimean Soviet would be dissolved and it became part of the Russian Soviet. Ukraine managed to amend their constitution so as to gain a certain international separation from the USSR while still being a part of the Union. Thus, Ukraine actually became one of the founding members of the United Nations, sitting on the Security Council in 1948 and 49. In 1954, the Crimean territory was transferred from Russia to Ukraine, Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev looking to reconcile with Ukraine after the death of Stalin. The 1980s saw Ukraine on the UN Security Council again, but 1986 saw the Chernobyl disaster, in which a nuclear power station went into meltdown and spread radioactive material across Europe. During the time of Perestroika, when Soviet restrictions were eased, many Crimean Tatars returned to Crimea after their long exile. When the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, Ukraine declared its independence, approved by referendum. In the 2000s, Ukraine, led by President Viktor Yushchenko, sought more and more to align with the European Union. The Russian leader Vladimir Putin did not recognise Ukrainian independence, viewing it as part of Russia. After the fall of the Soviet Union, the industries and services formerly owned by the state were snapped up by Russian businessmen who would de facto control the country as oligarchs. Russia had lost decent access to several of its important ports, and Ukraine's prominent position on the Black Sea was not to be allowed to leave so easily. In 2013, Ukrainian President Viktor Yanukovych refused to sign the Ukraine-European Union Association Agreement and sought for closer ties with Russia instead. This sparked protests in Kyiv, leading to violence with the police. Eventually, the Ukrainian parliament voted to remove Yanukovych, who fled to Russia. Not long after, Russia invaded and occupied Crimea, forcing a referendum of annexation back to Russia, a referendum denounced as illegal by the EU and USA. In the wake of this, pro-Russian separatists in eastern Ukraine rose up, leading to the ongoing war in Donbass. 
Ukraine, however, moved closer in aligning itself with the European Union, joining the deep and comprehensive free trade areas, being allowed easier access to the Schengen area, and edging away from the Commonwealth of Independent States, an economic body consisting of several former Soviet states. In 2019, Ukraine changed its constitution to suit the EU and NATO, and former comedian Volodymyr Zelensky became president. The United States President Donald Trump had his first impeachment over a phone conversation with Zelensky, as Trump threatened to withhold military aid to Ukraine if Zelensky didn't dig up dirt on his election opponent Joe Biden. The US ultimately sent the aid, and Trump was acquitted. In 2020, the Lublin Triangle was formed, an alliance bringing together the old union of Lithuania, Poland and Ukraine. As the westernization continued, Zelensky had pro-Russian channels banned in Ukraine as they broadcast in propaganda. With Ukraine looking all set to join the EU and NATO, Putin's forces invaded in early 2022. Expecting a swift victory, the Russians were met with the fiercest resistance from the Ukrainian people. We're here now in April 2022. You watching this in the future know more than me on how all this pans out. More and more stories come in daily about the atrocities happening there. Putin's official reasons for invading were to denazify Ukraine, the country who elected a Jewish president. Now, where there are fringe right-wing groups in the Ukrainian military, as with many armed forces around the world, Putin has used these fringe individuals as an excuse to declare war on the entire people of Ukraine. The world does not want this war. And with the outcry about the horrendous events of Ukraine and the care shown for the Ukrainian people, let us also remember that horrendous events too have been happening and continue to happen in Yemen, in Palestine, in Afghanistan, in Myanmar, in Ethiopia and countless other places across the world. And this isn't a whataboutism. This is a reminder that the care and support that we show to the people of Ukraine can also be extended to people across the world who are suffering through the horrors of war. Peace to Ukraine. And peace to the world. Thanks for watching, folks. You can support this channel by liking this video, sharing, subscribing, and on patreon.com forward slash John D. Ruddy. Thanks again to the Kings and Generals channel for reaching out to include me in Project Ukraine. More importantly though, please support the Babanyar Holocaust Memorial Center in Kyiv, who is helping the humanitarian crisis in Kyiv, or indeed any charity helping the whole situation. Special welcome to my newest patrons, Chris Barker, John Moroni. And thanks to all my patrons, Undersurf, David B, Magnus Norden, Play Skippy, Dakin Arboros, Austin Graves, Brendan J Cassidy, Carl D Manry, Joshua Benjamin Heisler, Keel Adam, La Pre Shea Queen Farah, Mike Wise, Patrick McGrath, Rena McNeil, Serena Kajani, Paul Minogue, Arwen D, Jen, Matophobia, Judy Friesen, Chair DJ, Marcus Booker, Rocket Wrench, Five Days Late, WSG. David Stranad, Cafe YouTube, Alexander, Kanku, Colton Sayre, Dylan Burns, Emer Gibson, Senan, age 10, Felix Bruma, Gretchen Sand, Helena RB, Jefferson Yates, Josh, Josh, Catherine Gilks, Kilroy McNalsty, Cobrag 90, Lewis Kennedy, Monday Rico, Mr. Magnificent, Mr. Research, Classy Black Men, Mr. Easy Play 2, Mycroft, Myth Nguyen, Ollie Course, Ryan Alano, Seth Wiley, Shane McDonough, Stephanie Lentz, Talitha Brower. Once again, thank you. Ba-bum.